Welcome to Two Minute Neuroscience, where I simplistically explain neuroscience topics in two minutes or less. In this installment, I will discuss the neuron. This is a brain. Estimates vary, but right now the best guess seems to be that our brains contain around 85 billion neurons. The neuron is a nerve cell, and it's the primary functional unit of the nervous system. This is a generic image of a neuron. Neurons actually come in all shapes and sizes, but this is the prototypical version of a neuron that you'll often see in a textbook. The structures extending from the left side of the neuron that look a little bit like tree branches are called dendrites. Dendrites are the area where neurons receive most of their information. There are receptors on dendrites that are designed to pick up signals from other neurons that come in the form of chemicals called neurotransmitters. Those signals picked up by dendrites cause electrical changes in a neuron that are interpreted in an area called the soma, or the cell body. The soma contains the nucleus, which contains the DNA, or genetic material of the cell. The soma takes all the information from the dendrites and puts it together in an area called the axon hillock. If the signal coming from the dendrites is strong enough, then a signal is sent to the next part of the neuron, which is called the axon. At this point, the signal is called an action potential. The action potential travels down the axon, which is covered with myelin, an insulatory material that helps to prevent the signal from degrading. The last step for the action potential is the axon terminals, also known as synaptic buttons. When the signal reaches the axon terminals, it can cause the release of neurotransmitter. These purple structures represent the dendrites of another neuron. When a neurotransmitter is released from axon terminals, it interacts with the receptors on the dendrites of the next neuron, and then the process repeats with the next neuron. The holonomic brain theory uh, is based on some insights that Dennis Gabor had. He's the inventor of the hologram, and he obtained the Nobel Prize for his uh, many contributions. He was a mathematician, and uh, <clears throat> what he was trying to do is develop a better way of making electron micrographs, uh, improve the resolution of electron micrographs. And so, uh, for electron microscopy, he suggested that instead of uh, making a photograph, essentially, not with electron microscopes, we make photographs of, but using electrons instead of photons. Right. And uh, he thought maybe instead of making ordinary photographs, uh, what he would do is get the interference patterns. Now, what is an interference pattern? When, when light strikes or when electrons strike any object, uh, they scatter. Mm -hmm. But the scatter is a funny kind of scatter. Uh, it's a very well-regulated scatter. Uh, for instance, if you defocus a lens on a camera so that you don't get the image falling on the image plane and you have a blur, that blur essentially is a hologram oh. because all you have to do is refocus, refocus it. it so contained in the blur is that the actual is, image. That's right, and, mm -hmm. but you don't see it as such. And so one of the main principles of holonomic brain theory which gets us into quantum mechanics also, is that um, there is a relationship here between what we ordinarily experience and some other process or some other order, <coughs> which David Bohm calls the implicate or enfolded order, in which things are all distributed or spread. And in fact, uh, the mathematical uh, formulations are often called spread functions that spread, mm -hmm. spread this out now, what you're talking yeah, about here is the, the deep structure of the universe, Fine. in a way, un, under the, the, beneath the subatomic level, virtually. That's right. Of, of matter itself are the, these quantum wave functions, That's so right. to speak. And That's they right. form interference patterns. Would, would it be wrong in saying it would be like dropping two stones in a pond, the, the way the ripples overlap? And is that like certainly an interference? One, that's certainly the way interference patterns are made. And you're yes. suggesting that at that very deep level of reality, something is operating in the brain itself? Well, no. Okay. Uh, in a way, that's possible, mm -hmm. but that's not where the situation is at the moment. Okay. All we know is that the mathematical descriptions that we make of, let's say, single cell processes mm -hmm. and the, the branches from the single cells and how they interact with the each other, mm -hmm. not only anatomically, but actually functional interactions, mm -hmm. that uh, when we map those, we get a description 
that is very similar to the description of quantum events. Uh -huh. When you take into account that there are billions of these single cells That's right. operating in the and, brain. And the connections between them. Mm -hmm. So there are even more, there are trillions of connections mm -hmm. between them. And they operate on the basic principles that have been found to also operate at quantum level. Actually, it was the other way around. That the mathematics that Gabor used, he borrowed from Heisenberg and Hilbert, who mm -hmm. developed them first in mathematics for Hilbert, and then Heisenberg used it uh, in quantum mechanics, and then Gabor used it in psychophysics, mm -hmm. and we've used it in modeling how brain mm -hmm. networks work. So, in, in other words, in the brain, when we look at the electrical impulses traveling through the neurons and the patterns as, as these billions of neurons interact, you would say that that is analogous, I suppose, or isomorphic to the processes that are going on at the deeper quantum level. Yes. Uh, but we don't know that it's a deeper quantum level, I mean, in mm -hmm. the brain. It's just, right. it's uh, analogous. That may or may not be the case. Yeah, analogous isn't quite the right word. Uh, they, they obey the same rules. Mm -hmm. They obey the same rules. It's not just mm -hmm. an analogy because yeah. the work that described these came independently mm -hmm. of, see, an analogy would be that you take the quantum ideas and see how they fit to the brain, the data we yes. have on the brain. Yes. And that's not the way it happened. Mm -hmm. We got the brain data first, yes. and then we see, uh, look, it fits the It'll same be. mathematics. So it, uh, the people who are gathering these data, including myself, weren't out to look for an, uh, an analogous mm -hmm. process. And mm -hmm. I think it's a very important yeah. point, because otherwise, you could be biased, and there are lots of different models that fit mm -hmm. how the brain works. But this is more based on how the brain was found to work independent of these conceptions.